The sedge strewn stream and globalization. The Vikings were horrid people, to whom history has, for some strange reason, been very indulgent. Whether it was the rape, the killing, the human sacrifice that you objected to, it was probably a bad thing when Vikings arrived at Lindisfarne in 793 and then began to work their way down the northeast coast of England. They quickly got to Yorkshire, and near what is now Harrogate, one of them found a sedge-strewn stream, and decided to call it Sedge Stream. Except, of course, he didn't call it that, because Sedge Stream would be English. He called it Sedge Stream in Old Norse, and in Old Norse, for Sedge Stream, it was Starbeck. Starbeck is now a little suburb on the eastern edge of Harrogate. The stream is still there, though there's no discernible sedge, and it runs quite a bit of its way underground in a pipe next to the railway tracks. The place name is first recorded in 1817, but as we've seen, it must go back to the Vikings, and we also know that there were people there in the 14th century. These people had sex as people almost invariably do, and produced a family. The family were named for the place where they lived, almost. One vowel was changed. The Starbuck family are first recorded living in just the right area in 1379. Since then, two things have happened. The Quaker movement was founded and America was discovered. The result of this double catastrophe was that among the first settlers in Nantucket Island near Cape Cod was a Quaker family whose name was Starbuck. Exactly how much they quaked is not recorded, but they did become big players in Nantucket's biggest trade, whaling. The Starbuck family took up their harpoons with a vengeance. They were soon the most famous whalers in Nantucket, if not the world. In 1823, Valentine Starbuck was chartered by the King and Queen of Hawaii to take them on a trip to England, where the misfortunate pair died of measles. Obed Starbuck discovered Starbuck Island in the Pacific and named it in honour of his cousin. A little over 20 years later, a man called Herman Melville began to write a novel about whales and whaling. Specifically, he wrote about a ship called the Pickwad setting sail from Nantucket to hunt a white whale known as Moby Dick. Melvin had been a whaler himself and had heard of the famous Starbuck whalers of Nantucket, so he decided to call the first mate of the Pickwad Starbuck in their honour. Moby Dick wasn't a very popular novel at first. Most people, especially the British, couldn't make head or tail of it, though it was largely because of the British edition was missing the last chapter. However, in the 20th century, novels that nobody can make head or tail of became very much the fashion, and Moby Dick was taken up by all and sundry, especially American school teachers, who've been inflicting its purple prose on children ever since. There was one particular English teacher in Seattle who loved the book. His name was Jerry Baldwin. Baldwin and two friends wanted to start a coffee shop. They needed a name, and Jerry Baldwin knew exactly where to find the right one in the pages of Moby Dick. He told his business partners of his fantastic idea. They were going to call the coffee shop, wait for it, Pequod. His business partners pointed out quite rightly that if you plan to open a shop selling potable fluids, you probably don't want to name to contain the syllable P. That's just bad marketing. So Baldwin was overruled, and the others started looking for something a little more local. On a map of the area, they found an old mining settlement in the Rocky Mountains called Camp Starbo. Baldwin's two partners decided that Starbo was a great name. But Jerry Baldwin was not to be defeated. He suggested they compromise with a little alteration to the second syllable that would make the name match the Pequod's first mate, Starbucks. Starbucks. 
The three of them agreed, and the, that Viking's name for a little stream in Yorkshire became one of the most famous brands in the world. The High Street might be a different place if Baldwin had remembered that Moby Dick was based on a real white whale that was said to have fought off over a hundred whaling parties in the Pacific of the early 19th century, and that whale was called Mocha Dick. There are no branches of Starbucks on Starbuck Island, but that's probably because there are no people there either, and the occasional seal is unlikely to have the cash. Coffee. Balzac once wrote that this coffee falls into your stomach and straight away there is a great commotion. Ideas begin to move like the battalions of the Grand Army of the battlefield and the battle takes place. Things remembered arrive at full gallop. Ensuing to the wind, the light cavalry of comparisons deliver a magnificent deploying charge. The artillery of logic hurry up with their train and ammunition. The shafts of wit start up like sharpshooters. Similars arise. The paper is covered with ink. For the struggle commences and is concluded with torrents of black water, just as a battle with powder. But Shakespeare never drank coffee. Nor did Julius Caesar or Socrates. Alexander the Great conquered half the world without even a cafe latte to perk him up in the morning. The pyramids were designed and constructed without a whiff or a sniff of caffeine. Coffee was introduced to Europe only in 1615. The achievements of antiquity are quite enough to cow the modern human, but when you realise that they did it all without caffeine, it becomes almost unbearable. The words for coffee arrange themselves beautifully into highly caffeinated spirals. Let's start with espressos and consider what they have to do with expressing yourself. An espresso is made in a little machine that presses steam outwards espresso in Italian through tightly packed grains of coffee. It's exactly the same process by which the cow expresses milk or a saw expresses pus and metaphorically it's the same process by which your thoughts are expressed outwards from your brain through your mouth thus self-expression. Those actions that have been thought about are premeditated, intentional and deliberate. If for example you have done something expressly for a purpose, it's because you have thought about it. How does this connect with express mail? Expressly came to mean for one particular purpose. A letter can be entrusted either to the tender mercies of the national postal system, who will probably lose it, burn it or deliver it back to you a month later with a fine, or it can be given a paid messenger who has one express job to deliver that one letter. This is an express delivery, one where a postman has been hired expressly for the purpose. And the same is true of trains. Some trains stop at every station. No village, halt or stray cow is too small or too irrelevant to slow you down. All this can be avoided if, rather than taking a stopping train, you board one that is bound expressly for one particular destination. Such trains are now known as express trains, and they usually have a little buffet car where you can pay a small fortune for a tiny espresso. Cappuccino monks. If expressive espressos have a circuitous etymology, it has nothing compared to the frothy delights of the cappuccino. In 1520, a monk called Matteo da Bascio decided that his fellow Franciscans were all terrible Sybarites who had fallen away from the original calling of St Francis. They did luxurious things like wearing shoes, and de Basquio decided to start a new order of pure, barefoot Franciscans. The old Franciscans were rather hurt by this and tried to suppress Matteo's unshot breakaways. He was forced to flee into hiding with the sympathetic Camaldolis, Camaldolis monks who wore little hoods called, in Italian, cappuccinos. Matteo and his brethren wore the cappuccinos themselves just to blend in. 
But when his breakaway order got official recognition in 1528, they found that they had become so used to the hoods that they decided to keep them on. His followers were therefore nicknamed the Capuchin Monks. The Capuchin Monks spread quickly all over Catholic Europe, and their hoods had become so familiar that when a century later explorers in the New World found apes with a dark brown patch on the top of their heads that looked like a little monkey hood, they decided to call them Capuchin Monkeys. What's particularly beautiful about this name is that, so far as anybody can tell, monkeys are named after monks. You see, most people agreed with Matteo de Basquio. Far from being models of chastity and virtue, medieval monks were all filthy sinners and little better than animals. So what do you call that brown hairy ape? A monkey. The habit of the Capuchin order was, and is, a pretty sort of creamy brown colour. So when the new frothy, creamy, chocolate sprinkled form of coffee was invented in the first half of the 20th century, it was named after their robes, the cappuccino. Mind you, most baristas wouldn't understand you if you ordered a little hood. But then again, most baristas don't realise that they are really barristers. Call to the bar. Barista. The chap who serves you a coffee is a case of English lending a word to Italian and then taking it straight back again. A barista is nothing more than an Italian barman. The ist suffix just means practitioner, as in a Marxist or evangelist. A bar, as any good dictionary would tell you, is a rod of wood or iron that can be used to fasten a gate. From this came the idea of a bar as any let or hindrance that can stop you going where you want to. Specifically, the bar in a pub or tavern is the barrier behind which is stored all the lovely intoxicating liquors that only the barman is allowed to lay his hands on without forking out. We are all at times called to the bar, if only in order to pay the bill. But the bar to which barristers were called was a lot less alcoholic even though it was in an inn. Half a millennium ago, all English lawyers were required to train at the inns of court in London. These inns were not the pleasant inns that served beer. They were merely lodging houses for students of the law because inn originally just meant house. The internal arrangements of the inns of court was as Byzantine and incomprehensible as one could expect from a building devoted to the law. But basically, there were the readers, who were clever folk and sat in an inner sanctum separated from the rest of the students by a big bar. The lesser students would sit around reading and studying and dreaming of the great day when they would be called to the bar and allowed to plead a case like a proper lawyer. The situation was complicated by the fact that they used to be, an out of, they used to be outer barristers and inner barristers who had a particular relationship with sheriffs at law and you'd probably have to study for a few years before you understood the bar system even partially and it wouldn't do you any good anyway as just when you thought you got a grip on things the meaning of bar was changed and that's the law for you. In about 1600 the word bar started to be applied to a wooden railing that ran round every courtroom in England at which prisoners had to stand while the judge ticked them off or sentenced them or fumbled with his black cap, the defendant's barrister would stand next to him at the bar and plead his case. Meanwhile, the prosecuting lawyer would insist that the prisoner was guilty and that he was ready to prove his case. If he insisted in French, this in French, he'd say, culpable, pre d'avere nostre bill. That was a bit of a mouthful so it would be shortened to culprit. Culpable prest. Devere notre bill. Culprit. Then the defendant's fate would be handed over to a jury. And if the jury couldn't decide, then they would declare, we don't know, but they would declare it in Latin. And the Latin for we don't know is ignoramus. Ignoramus was therefore a technical legal term 
until a writer called George Ruggle used it as the title for a play in 1615, the main character of which was a stupid lawyer called Ignoramus or Ignoramus. This also means that the plural of Ignoramus is definitely not Ignorami. Ignorami. Christians are all cretins, etymologically speaking, and cretins are all Christians. If this sounds unfair, it's because language is much less kind than religion. The original cretins were deformed and mentally deficient dwarves found only in a few remote valleys in the Alps. These days their condition would be called congenital iodine deficiency syndrome. But the Swiss didn't know anything about that. All they knew was that though these people had a problem, they were still human beings and fellow Christians. So they called them cretins, which means Christians. They meant this in a nice way. It was like calling them fellow humans. But of course the word got taken up by bullies and like spastic in modern playgrounds, cretin quickly acquired a derogatory sense, so Christian became a term of abuse. The first idiots were also Christian, or rather the first Christians were idiots. The word idiot first appears in English in the Wycliffe Bible of 1382. There in the Book of Deeds, which we would call Acts, it says that forsooth they sang the steadfastness of Peter and John, found them that they were men with adletris and idiotis. A verse that was translated in the King James Version as, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. But in the Latin of St. Jerome, the passage ran, Videntes autum Petri Constantiam et Hionanis Comperto, quod homines essent sine literis, et idiote. St Peter and St John were idiots simply because they were laymen. They had no qualifications and were therefore their own men rather than belonging to some professional class. If they had spoken their own language it would have been an idiom and if they had been eccentrics with their own way of doing things which they undoubtedly were they would have been idiosyncratic. Neither cretin nor idiot was originally meant to be an insult. One was a compliment and the other a simple description. But people are cruel and are always casting about for new ways to abuse others. As fast as we can think up technical terms and euphemisms like cretin, moron, idiot or spastic, people will take the words and use them to be nasty to others. Consider the poor moron the term was invented in 1910 by an American association for the study of the feeble-minded. They took an obscure Greek word, moros, which means dull or foolish, and used it to refer to those with an IQ of between 50 and 70. The idea was that it would be a word reserved for doctors and diagnosis. Within seven years the word had escaped from medical circles and was being used as an insult. Incidentally, moron meant dull, but in Greek, oxy meant sharp. Many, many chapters ago, we saw how oxygen got its name because it generated acids. And the oxy in oxymoron has the same root. So the oxymoron is a sharp softness. The unkindest twist of the English language is perhaps that which happened to John Duns Scotus, 1265 to 1308. He was the greatest theologian and thinker of his day, the Dr. Subtilis, the philosopher of the University of Being, master of the formal distinction and of the concept of heisaity, the essential property that makes each things this and not that. Duns Scotus had a formidable mind which he used to draw the finest distinctions between different ideas. This was, linguistically, his downfall and destruction. When Duns Scotus died, his many followers and disciples lived on. They pursued and expanded on his astonishingly complicated philosophical system of distinctions and differences. One could almost say that they, like their master, 
were hair splitters and pedants. In fact, people did say they were hair splitters and pedants. When the Renaissance came along, people suddenly got rather enlightened and humanist and were terribly angry when Dunn's men, as they were called, tried to contradict them with an obscure Aristotelian enthymeme. Dunn's men became the enemies of progress. The idiots who had turned the clock back and returned to the Dark Ages and Duns started to be spelt dunce. Thus did the greatest mind of his generation become a synonym for gormless. This is terribly unfair, for Duns Scottus was full of gorm. He was brilling over with the stuff, and if you don't know what gorm is, that's because it's a fossil word. Fossil this. Do you have any gorm? It's an important question. Because if you don't have any gorm, it logically follows that you are gormless. Gormless is a fossil. Dinosaurs and trilobites once flourished, now only fossils remain, petrified and scattered. The same has happened to gorm, feck, ruth and wreck. They were all once real words, now they're frozen forever in less phrases. Gorm, spelled all sorts of ways, was a Scandinavian word making, meaning sense or understanding. As a 12th century monk called Orm put it, and Junk burp nimen mikkelgom to perwen Junker childre. A sentiment which we can all, I'm sure, agree. However, poor Gorm, or Gome, rarely got written down. It was a dialect word used by Yorkshiremen and most of the literary action was happening in London. However, in the 19th century, Emily Bronte wrote a book called Wuthering Heights in which is the line, did I ever look so stupid, so gormless as Joseph calls it? Joseph is a servant who speaks with a strong Yorkshire accent and the word gormless is clearly being brought in as an example of one of his dialect terms. Joseph would probably have used the word gorm as well, but Emily Bronte doesn't mention it, so Gormless got into one of the most famous novels ever written, while poor Gorm was left to pine away and die on a lonely moor in York Yorkshire. Once upon a time there was the word effect. It was a happy, useful, innocent word until it went to Scotland. Once north of Hadrian's Wall, the word effect was cruelly robbed of its extremities and became feck. Indolent, vigorous Scotsmen who had no effect on things were therefore feckless. This time it was not Bronte but Thomas Carlyle, a Scot, who brought the word into common usage. He used feckless to describe the Irish and his wife. However, it's hard to see exactly what Carlyle meant by feckless. This from a letter of his in 1842. Poor Alan's dust was laid in Kensal Green, far enough from his native Kirkmanhoe. Madamid was has a well-meant but very feckless article upon him this week. In another letter, Carlyle wrote that the summer had made his wife feckless. And he even described how living with her in London had turned the couple into a feckless pair of bodies, a pair of miserable creatures. Anyway. Carlyle used feckless, but he never used the word feck, and so the one word lived became famous, while the other vanished into a Celtic twilight. Reckless is far simpler, and there's more poetry in it, which is the important thing. Wreck used to mean care, although it's etymologically far from reckon. As Chaucer put it, I wreck naught what wrong that thou me proffer, for I can suffer it as a philosopher. Shakespeare used wreck too, yet by this time it already had an archaic feel. In Hamlet, Ophelia chides her brother thus, Do not, as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, whilst like a puffed and reckless libertine, himself the primrose path of dalliance treads, and wrecks not his own reed. Reed was an archaic and ancient word for advice. And wreck was probably already an archaic and ancient word for take notice of. Shakespeare used reckless six times in his complete works, 
as much as all the other wrecks, wreckiths and wreckids put together. Wreck must already have been hiding and fading, reckless, rushing headlong to the future. If something is true, it's the truth. If you rue your actions, you feel a ruth. If you don't rue your actions, you feel no ruth, and that makes you ruthless. Ruth survived for quite a long time, and it's uncertain as to why it died out in the end. Maybe it's just that there, was more, there were more ruthless people than ruthful ones. Language sometimes doesn't have an explanation. Words rise and die for no reason that an etymologist can discover. History is not immaculate. In fact, it is maculate. We might feel more consolate if we could give a span and even spick explanation for everything, but to no avail. And so we come exorably to the end of our study of fossil words. We could go on, as the language is brimming with them, but you might become listless and disgruntled. P.G. Woodhouse once remarked of a chap that, if not exactly disgruntled, he was far from being gruntled. So let us continue by seeing exactly how gruntling relates to grunt. The frequentative suffix. If a gem frequently sparks, we say that it sparkles. If a burning log frequently emits cracking noises, then it crackles. That's because l, crackle, is a frequentative suffix. With this in mind, let's turn to grunting. To gruntle is to grunt often. If a pig makes one noise, it has grunted. If it grunts again, you may add the frequentative suffix and call the pig a gruntler. A medieval travel writer called Sir John Mandeville described the men who live in the desert near the Garden of Eden thus, In that desert are many wild men. They are hideous to look on, for they are horned, and they speak not, but gruntle, as swines do. But the dis in disgruntled is not a negative prefix, but an intensive one. If the verb already carries negative connotations, and something that makes you keep grunting is probably no good, then the negative dis it just emphasises how bad it is. Disgruntled therefore means almost the same thing as gruntled. Some frequentatives are a little more surprising. The next time you're being jostled in a crowd, you may reflect that your fate is rather milder than someone who is repeatedly being attacked by a jousting knight. Medieval lovers used to fond each other, and if they did this too often, they began to fondle. Fondling is a dangerous business, as sooner or later it leads to snugging, an archaic word that meant to lie down together in order to keep warm. Repeating incidences of snugging will result in snuggling and pregnancy. Whether you trumple, tootle, wrestle or fizzle, you're being frequentative. So here's a little puzzle. A puzzle being a question that is frequently posed. What are the originals of these frequentatives? Nuzzle, bustle, waddle, straddle, swaddle. Of course, the reason you can't get all of those immediately is that a frequentative often leaves home and starts to be a word in its own right. Take the word in the Latin pensare, which meant to think and from which we get the words pensive and pansy, a flower given to a loved one to make them think of you. The Romans thought that thinking was nothing more than repeatedly weighing things up. So pensare is a frequentative of pendere, to weigh or hang, from which we get more words than you might think. Pending. The Latin pendere meant to hang, and its past participle was pensum. In meant not, di meant from, sus meant down. So if you are independent, you are not dependent. Because the only things that are dependent are pendulums and pendants that hang around your neck. Pendants are therefore pending or indeed impending. They are at least suspended. <laughs> 
and are therefore left hanging in suspense. Weighing scales hang in the balance. Scales can weigh out gold for paving, paying pensions, stipends, compensations, in pesos, but not pence, which is etymologically unrelated. All such dispensations must, of course, be weighed up mentally. One must be pensive before being expensive. You must give equal weight to all arguments in order to have either equipoise or poise. If you don't give equal weight to all things, your scales will hang too much to one side and you'll end up with a preponderance and propensity towards your own penchants. penchants. Whether these penchants make you perpendicular, I'm too polite to ask. I hope there's a section on the pendulous hung together. If it did, it was a compendium. And though there are a few more words from the same root to include them all, which require the appendic, appending of an appendix. An appendix, in either a book or a body, is where you put all the useless crap. However, the bodily tube is more properly known as the vermiform appendix, which makes it sound even less pleasant than it is, because vermiform means worm-like, which is something to consider next time you eat vermi jelly. Worms and their turnings. Worms have a hard time. We're not being chased about by early birds or being disturbed in their can. They get trodden on. It's no surprise that Shakespeare records them fighting back against their oppressors. The smallest worm will turn, being trodden on, and doves will peck in safeguard of their brood. William Blake, on the other hand, claimed that the cut worm forgives the plough, which seems extraordinarily unlikely. Etymologically, it's hardly surprising that worms turn. Worm comes from the Proto-Indo-European were, meaning turn, a reference to its bendiness. To a worm turning is not just appropriate, it's a tautology. Worms have come a long way down in the world, as the word worm used to mean dragon. Then from a huge fire-breathing monster, they became mere snakes. And slowly they declined until they became the little things in your garden being chased around by a blackbird or sliced up by William Blake. However, the dragon meaning survived for centuries and as late as 1867, William Morris could still write the wonderful line, therewith began a fearful battle betwixt worm and man with a straight face. The one constant in the etymological journey of the worm is that man doesn't like worms and worms don't like men. For a long time it was believed that garden worms could crawl into your ear and as the old English wicker could also mean worm, we get the strange modern formation earwig. Even though an earwig is technically not a worm but an insect and has nothing to do with the sort of wig you wear on your head. There are only two places where worms have turned and maintained some of their former greatness. One is a wormhole, which used to mean exactly what you might expect until 1957, when the word was hijacked by the Einstein-Rosen bridge, a theoretical connection between two parts of space-time implied, if not necessitated, by the theory of relativity. The other is the fearsome crocodile, whose name comes from the Greek Crocodrilos, which means pebble worm. Pebbles also play a crucial part in calculus, which means pebble. And so next on to mathematics. <laughs>